Hello everybody, we're here today, you're watching Yurikoze on YouTube, and we're here today to talk about uh, David Coffin, who you see there, and Scott Davis, who you see there, and also the dishonest nature of Megan Bruton, who you saw there. This is a, a wholly circumstantial case that hinges on the fact that Megan manipulated the situation, and Scott may very well be innocent. So we're going to go over some of those things here today, and in videos to come. Hello everybody! We're here today talking again about Scott Davis. This is going to be the, the, the video about Detective Rick Chambers, and I use the term detective loosely. Uh, anyway, for my MAM uh, viewers, maybe stick around for this one. I'm going to be talking about Zellner's uh, expert on investigations, because what he had to say applies here as well. Particularly in terms of going from an evidence-based investigation to a suspect-based investigation. But anyways, so what we're here today talking about is just, you know, Detective Rick Chambers, the lead detective on the case against Scott Davis. He led the investigation. He is, he's the head honcho. He's the guy that is, well, should have been held responsible for what happened. I mean, this guy, he's something else. He's truly, truly something else. He is so self-assured, yet in my, to my mind, he made every really dumb thing that he could have done, he did. That's, I mean, it's unbelievable. I, it, willful ignorance. Just the willful ignorance that he showed to go after Scott is, is amazing. It's, it's shocking. And so that we're going to be talking about some of that, but... What we're going to talk about first is just exactly how horrible the investigation was. And I tell you what, if you just came off of my, my other two videos, the videos about Sheila Ross, the, the prosecutor in this case, you heard me talking about in that video how she probably didn't thank Chambers very much because basically within a couple of hours, Chambers had moved from an evidence-based investigation to a suspect based investigation. Therefore, he didn't go and claim any other or get any other information about any other possible suspects. He didn't investigate any of that. It was all focused right onto Scott, pretty much right off the bat. And that's pretty much mistake number one right there. And you combine that with the fact that he's not only doing that, but he's also committing the willful ignorance that I was talking about by ignoring the fact that somebody was telling him. Somebody credible was telling him that Megan had said to Scott on the phone that David had been shot. Confirmed that night. At the same time that Chambers had decided to make Scott a suspect. Willful ignorance because that didn't fit his that didn't fit his theory. Didn't fit what he was didn't fit the the scenario he already picked out. That is what happened. It's obvious that that's what happened here. Because in light of all the new evidence about this case, the, <laughs> the, lost inter the lost interrogation tape that they claimed didn't exist, and then it was proven it did exist. I mean, there is so much. 72 pieces of lost evidence, which Chambers was responsible for, by the way. He's ultimately the, the one that was the most responsible for making sure that this evidence made it to trial. And... His, his excuses for that are whew, weak, very weak. He contradicts himself constantly. So what we're basically here talking about right now, to start it all off, to go down this road, this just to, to kind of tiptoe tip through the tulips, as it were, of this you know horrendous investigation. We're going to start with an expert brought in by Kathleen Zellner to help on the Stephen Avery case. A FBI agent with over 50 years of experience. An FBI agent who, when the Swedish FBI was being created at the end of last year, he is the man that was sent to go help them and teach them and, and, and help educate them in proper investigative tactics and, and all that stuff. He's the one that was chosen by... Now, the reason why I throw this out there is because a lot of people say, oh yeah, well, a defense lawyer went out and found an expert. Yeah, right. Well, okay, whatever. Well, this guy's credentials are through the roof. Okay? 
and what I'm saying is, is that for this guy to get chosen to go and head up, you know, and help the Swedish FBI get their their Federal Bureau of Investigation up and running and teach them and, sh- and, and instruct them on how to properly investigate. A lot of people had to had to go, oh, yeah, McCrary, that's your guy. He's the guy you need to send to do that. The fact that he got chosen to do that shows that a hell of a lot of people have a hell of a lot of respect for him. And that they obviously, you know, they obviously believe that he is absolutely credible, that he is absolutely the top in the field for him to get selected for for that type of thing. So we're now going to hear from him. We're going to find out, number one, two things. He's going to tell you, he's going to talk to you about something called victimology. Victimology is where you learn every possible single thing that you can about the victim. That's where you start an investigation. This is his words, not mine. This is where you start an investigation. You find out everything about the victim. You find out, you're going to see it's a list of things that he, he, but it's a pretty long list of things, but I'm sure the list is even longer. He was probably just hitting the high points of it, but... He, he talks about it. He talks about all the facts in a case come together like a mosaic. And if you, but only if it's investigated correctly. And then he's going to talk about how it is absolute, you know, death to go too quickly from an evidence based investigation to a suspect based investigation. He, he cannot be more clear on the fact that doing that too soon is absolute death for an investigation. In other words, it's it just it it makes the investigation completely uh, suspect because no longer are the the cops trying to find the evidence to figure out what happened. They have a they basically have a narrative and they're only looking to find the evidence that backs that up. And he basically says that. So I'm going to show you the document from him right now. Very highly qualified gentleman. And we'll come on back. I hold the following opinions regarding police practices and investigative procedures to a reasonable degree of professional certainty. Every meaningful analysis of violent crime begins with victimology, i.e. a study of the victim or victims. Victimology is the collection and assessment of all significant information as it relates to the victim and his or her lifestyle, personality, employment, education, friends, habits, hobbies, marital status, relationships, dating history, sexuality, reputation, criminal record, history of alcohol or drugs, physical condition, and a neighborhood of residence are all pieces of the mosaic that comprises victimology. The bottom line is, who was the victim and what was going on in his or her life at the time of the event? Was the victim having any problems? Had the victim recently expressed any fears? Did the victim express any concerns about his or her security? Was the victim in a relationship? Ascertaining the victimology is the key to any successful death investigation. And what's important here is he talks about a history of alcohol or drugs, but the prosecution and the investigation basically tried to hide that. They didn't want to look that way. Moving prematurely from an evidence-driven investigation to a suspect-driven investigation is particularly problematic and a common feature in investigative failures. The attitude becomes, we know who did it, now let's get the evidence that proves it. This type of tunnel vision leads to confirmation bias in searching for and interpreting evidence. Alternate hypotheses are not considered and alternate suspects not properly investigated. Remember, these are the words of a of an investigator with over 50 years of experience who is very passionate about his chosen profession. Investigators are the gatekeepers for the rest of the criminal justice system. At their best, investigators can protect us from some of society's most dangerous predators. At their worst, they can create and perpetuate egregious injustices. Investigators must keep an open mind about how to interpret data and evidence until they have gathered as many facts as possible. At its inception, an investigation should be multidimensional. No single hypothesis or suspect should either be embraced or eliminated until all pertinent facts and evidence have been collected and thoroughly examined. That makes a lot of sense to me. You want to make sure you find out who did it. And in doing so, you have to... 
study things that were around the victim. I mean, this is this is not like this is not like new. This is the way murder investigations are supposed to be. It's just you know, Chambers clearly went from an evidence-driven investigation to a suspect-driven investigation in just a couple of hours. I'm I'm just just putting that out there. It's the truth. So, as I said, those were the words of a FBI investigator with 50 plus years of experience. And he's now basically somebody who educates um, new investigators and stuff like that. He's top of the top of the rung, top in his field, obviously. And you see what he had to say there. I mean, he, I mean Chamber didn't do any of those things. Chambers didn't really do any of those things. He barely looks into victimology at all. He barely looks into David Coffin. There is a whole slew of shady characters that should have probably been looked into because, unfortunately, David Coffin was using some cocaine. So that means he would have had to have contact with some some shadier guys. And that should all have been looked into. That should all have been looked into. You know, not only did Chambers move from an evidence-based investigation way too soon to a suspect-based investigation, that I mean, that was huge mistake number one. But not only did he do that, but he also did that based that he made that that one decision based on nothing else but his own gut feeling. Literally nothing else. There was no evidence. There was no evidence of anything that first night other than David Coffin's house had burned and they did find a body. But they hadn't even proven that that was David Coffin's body yet. So he literally had nothing and made his decision to go from evidence-based to suspect-based. you got to be able to see the problem with that. The problem with that is huge because... He basically never looked, he never was able to look at any evidence. And, you know, with the circumstantial evidence case, it makes it all the more, you know, all the, all the more a problem that he went from evidence-based to suspect-based in just a couple hours based on his gut feeling. Because as it turns out, the evidence did not come out to support that. It, it didn't. And, and all he did was bury the evidence that was there that could have pointed to the real suspect but no he sat on it and buried it prints the blood so the blood swab all that ends up getting lost obviously this case proves you can't trust the state to hold on to it and bring it to the trial if they end up trying you this is the only way this case worked okay it's truly the only way it worked if that evidence came to, if that evidence made it to trial, Scott's team would have ran those prints and would have ran that blood. It would have been a whole different thing. It would have been a whole different ballgame. Because we, I, we, you know, we know that blood wasn't Scott's. Because that much we do know. Chamber, Chambers did do that much, and we know that the prints aren't Scott's. Because Chambers did do that much. But then after that, he just tells the fingerprint guy, "Okay, well, never mind." Don't put it into APHIS, just, you know, put it back into the locker or whatever, basically. Same with the blood. Don't, don't, don't bother trying to extract a DNA profile from it or whatever and, and enter it into a database and see if we come up with a match. No, don't even bother with that. I mean, willful ignorance, willful ignorance. Seriously, like a drumbeat, willful ignorance. So now we're going to move into a little clip about, well, with Chambers talking about Scott asking for a lawyer. About what had happened and it was in this process that Scott says I didn't shoot him the veteran investigator is stunned I, said, I don't even know how he died how do you know he shot well somebody must have told me well, well why would somebody tell you that when nobody knew that am I being um, arrested here arrested I mean, when I came in here I didn't I didn't think I was a you know, being a suspect, I was coming in to report being victimized. Are you willing to take a lie at this attempt? 
I'll have to ask my attorney about that one. Sorry. The right thing to do is say, yeah, I'll take your lie detector test. I'll take any test you want to. That's the yeah. right thing to do. I want an attorney. It was just, he got, he got agitated. That's about when he started asking for a lawyer. So, there you see, Chambers starts getting aggressive with Scott when Scott was, he came down there willingly to help. He wanted, they wanted him to give a statement. He came, of, you know, he went down there. He, you know, was trying to be helpful. And suddenly, he has Chambers trying to intimidate him and, and all this stuff. And... Scott, you know, when Scott tells him that, yeah, Megan told me that about David, he, Chambers leaves the room. He leaves the room. Comes back. Scott at this point, and, and starts going to Scott again. So you know at this point, Scott knows that that either that nobody either nobody believes that Megan told him that or whatever. So now he's really scared. He's really, really scared because Chambers came back in without he. Scott probably thinks n nobody told you know nobody told Chambers, but the fact is somebody did, and he still came back in there coming after Scott. Now the other thing that's happening in that clip is you hear a tape, an old cassette tape, being popped out of an old recording um, uh, machine. You can hear it. It's like a. It's an interesting sound, but it's just kind of like the tape kind of pops out. It's made of plastic, so it kind of jiggles around a little bit. There was two tapes, and you could hear one of the tapes being ejected in that audio clip that we were just we were just hearing there. So, I mean, there's all kinds of just whack, wacky, wacky stuff going on. I mean, just it. You can tell it's not above board. It's it's clearly not above board. Um, so, we're going to move into another clip now of Chambers talking about, talking about he wants to have Scott right. Okay, he did nothing from, from, from the, from the, big, from the opening hours of this investigation on, he did nothing to get Scott right. He basically assumed Scott and made sure he tried to pin everything to Scott. That's what he did. So there's no there's no having him right. He says that of course because he thinks it sounds good and it's a good sound bite for 48 hours, but it's full of crap. I went for Scott. I wanted to have him. I wanted to have him. And I want to have him right. Really Chambers? Because I really see virtually no part of this investigation where you actually tried to get anything right. Like, you, no, <laughs> no, you deliberately ignored standard operating procedure, really, in my mind. The fact that you didn't test the fingerprints of blood, I don't know how that's, I don't know how that's even acceptable. The fact that you moved from an evidence-based investigation to a suspect-based investigation without having seen any freaking evidence yet, hmm, another bad, bad move. So... You got a lot of bad moves compounded on top of bad moves. So when I hear you talking about you wanted to have him and you wanted to have him right. Yeah, dude, really? Because you did pretty much everything in your power to make sure you didn't. That's why it's a wholly, entirely circumstantial case against him. You don't have any hard evidence against him because you chased the wrong guy. You focused in on the wrong guy way too freaking early. And you gathered not enough information about David Coffin as the victim to be able to try and figure out what happened. To find out who the evidence did fit. That's what happened here. So. I guess that's, a, that's enough of me ranting about Chambers for now. We'll see you later. And please hit subscribe.